All right. So those are kind of your antiarrhythmics divided into brady uh, arrhythmics, tachy antiarrhythmics, and then subdividing those uh, accordingly. Now, actual disease scenarios other than arrhythmias, I'm going to start off with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It is primarily a disease of cats. It can be secondary to hyperthyroidism or it can be idiopathic. Okay. <clears throat> now, why does it cause uh, problems? The myocardium actually hypertrophies, so you get really, really thick ventricular walls and a thick ventricular septum. Okay. Now that sounds like a good thing. That ought to be a really strong heart. But the problem is it thickens so much it interferes with outflow. Okay. And also now instead of a ventricular chamber like that when it relaxes during diastole, you get a ventricular chamber like that when it relaxes. So there's just not much space for the blood to flow into. So both result in a decrease in cardiac output. And uh, you have backup, uh, so you have increases in left ventricular and left atrial pressure uh, leading to congestion of the pulmonary vein and leading to pulmonary edema, pleural or pericardial effusion. By the way, congestion in terms of medicine refers to an accumulation of blood, a backup of blood. Congestive heart failure refers to a backup of blood uh, in the heart and pulmonary system. Okay. What can we do? Uh, well, if it is hyperthyroidism, we can go ahead and treat the cat for that. Okay. And a lot of the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy due to hyperthyroidism is at least partially reversible. You control the hyperthyroidism, you will improve the uh, cardiac function. It will start to shrink back down. May not return to normal, but it does improve. But at least part of it is, can be idiopathic. So we have to work on that. And we're going to decrease our left atrial and left ventricular pressure so we don't get the pulmonary edema and pleural effusions. We're going to try to relax the heart muscle because <clears throat> um, a good way to think of, of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is like the, the athlete that has worked out and taken anabolic steroids so much that he's muscle bound. He's got a lot of muscle, but he's lost all his flexibility and ability to, to move. And that's kind of what's happened here. So we're going to try to relax that heart muscle and we're going to slow the heart rate. Heart rate is picked up because cardiac output has dropped. So that's not a good thing, so we're going to slow it. All right, now, you're going to probably see two scenarios. When you're doing health maintenance, you may pick this up before clinical signs occur. Uh, you hear a heart murmur on a cat. You should assess whether or not it might have heart failure, and the most likely reason is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So you're going to do um, RADS. Echo is probably the most beneficial, though. Uh, and you get to them early enough to treat them before clinical signs develop. The other scenario is when they present with clinical signs and they're going to be very dyspneic. Uh, first thing you want to do is give oxygen. Okay, oxygen, it's intuitive because you want more oxygen being pumped around, but oxygen also is a very good uh, dilator of the pulmonary artery. Okay. So in addition to supplying more oxygen to the tissue, it decreases your hydrostatic pressure in your pulmonary artery. So you get less driving pressure for pulmonary edema and pleural effusions. The second thing you do is you add furosemide as a loop diuretic. That's going to inhibit chloride reabsorption in the loop of Henle's. Now <clears throat> that's going to uh, decrease preload. And I hope you remember, but let me just point out preload versus afterload. Preload refers to the amount of blood returning to the heart on the right side. Afterload is the pressure that the left side of the heart has to overcome to push the blood out to the tissues. Okay. Both can go astray in heart failure scenarios. 
Well, the furosemide decreases preload, and I'll talk about that in a little bit more, why that's good. But you see a benefit in pulmonary edema almost immediately from furosemide that has nothing to do with its diuretic preload effects. And that is that furosemide causes a local release of prostaglandins in the lung that are vasodilatory and perhaps a little bronchodilatory. So again, you've got a pulmonary artery that starts off having that width, and you give um, furosemide Lasix and it becomes that wide. Well, if it's the same amount of blood in a larger tube, then the pressure drops. So you get decreased hydrostatic pressure driving it out. <clears throat> Unrelated to this, but probably the same mechanism is why it works in pulmonary-induced exercise um, hemorrhage exercise-induced pulmonary hemorrhage in horses. Okay, one of the standard things that helps in that disease is to give uh, furosemide prior to exertion. It's probably that same vasodilatory mechanism of the pulmonary artery. Okay, so we were talking about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in cats. And um, when they're in actual failure, you see the pulmonary edema, the respiratory signs. I talked about the oxygen, the furosemide, the opioids. But in terms of actually treating the heart, uh, this is really totally different than systolic heart failure. Okay, and I, I kind of explain the muscle-bound aspects of it. Really what we're trying to do here is slow the heart rate again for the same reason, to allow better diastolic filling, and relax the heart muscle, all right? Uh, and that's called lucitropy. And we use two drugs for that. We use either diltiazem, which is a calcium channel blocker, or we use the tenolol, which is, again, a beta-1 uh, selective blocker, okay? Actually, I consider them to be the better lucitrope in terms of relaxing the heart, okay? Uh, it comes in different forms. The regular release uh, is every eight hours. Most people will use one of the sustained release products. Here, because all of these are human products, we have to make some adjustments. Uh, for example, if you take a number four gelatin capsule, and fill it uh, with the Cardizem CD. That's about right for a 10-pound cat. The Dilacor uh, capsules, if you break the capsule, you actually find a little bitty pellets inside the capsule, and one pellet is about right for a 14-pound cat. The problem uh, with Diltiazem is not that it doesn't work. Uh, it's probably the better of the two, at least hypothetically, but it's not, doesn't have as good a patient tolerance as a tenolol. Uh, we see more side effects, and the benefit has not really clinically been established that it's better than the tenolol. So although from a pharmacologic standpoint, uh, diltiazem is my preferred, a tenolol is still used a great deal, and I certainly can't uh, complain about it. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> we also use it if this is a hyperthyroid cat while we're giving the anti-thyroid medications. Uh, we oftentimes will add a tenolol there to decrease some of the tachycardias and that sort of thing that we see with hyperthyroidism regardless of whether they have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, not all hyperthyroid cats have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. All right, so either of these two drugs, both to relax the heart and slow the heart rate, but atenolol is the better tolerated of the two. I don't have a place to otherwise talk about the, the, some specific non-selected beta blockers. Atenolol is beta-1, which is what we're after. Uh, the original beta blocker was propranolol. It's a, a beta-1, beta-2. We really don't want the beta-2 block. It was just that that's what came along. So uh, <laughs> uh, largely, it's been replaced. I'll mention one thing. There are beta-2 receptors in the muscle, okay? 
And uh, this, this is not veterinary medicine, but I know you began your surgery. And one of the things that I have had a personal problem with for a long time as I've gotten older is hand tremors when I'm sitting doing detail work, okay? And one of our technicians, when I was doing surgery in, in uh, community practice, especially dentals, would give me hell because my hands would sit there and shake. <laughs> and she, I said, I'm not nervous. I just can't control this. I wound up going to a neurologist for carpal tunnel, and I asked him about it, and he said, well, did either of your parents have this? And I said, oh, yeah, my dad was terrible. He said, you have a familial hand tremor. Uh, <laughs> it's inherited. Uh, you can't do anything uh, um, about doing away with it, but propranolol taken in advance tends to decrease that. So when you're in there doing your suturing and everything and your hands are shaking, I'm not telling you to go on propranolol because at this point you probably are nervous. <laughs> and so I don't want to give you a crutch, but if it, uh, if it uh, comes uh, as a constant problem, that's something you can talk to your physician about. Um, because it is pretty well tolerated. Okay. Ironically enough, a few years later, that same technician asked me what I was using because he had a friend that couldn't hold his gun steady when he went uh, deer hunting. I didn't care about the deer hunting, but I told him. Um, <laughs> all right, so that's for panel uh, Two others that we use diagnostically. Esmolol is, is interesting. Uh, it's an ultra short acting beta blocker, okay? And they use it in human medicine during surgery because they can titrate the beta block to effect, especially bypass, uh, well not by bypass, they're all there, but um, some of the, uh, the valve replacements, all the things that they do in surgery, they can titrate a heart rate with esmolol. If it gets too low, they just decrease the CRI, uh, not um, low it rate enough, increase it. Again, you need to know how to do a CRI. All right. Um, where we use it is in animals where they have heart, high heart rates and we're wondering will they benefit from a beta blocker. So I will give a uh, CRI of esmolol and see if that uh, improves their hemodynamics. And if it does, then I'll switch them to a tenolol. Okay. Uh, a lot of practitioners don't have esmolol, but timolol is an ophthalmic beta blocker used for glaucoma. And there's a recent paper that came out that showed uh, timolol eye drops actually decreased the heart rate for about one to two hours. So it could be used again as kind of a diagnostic tool. But uh, back to straight uh, feline hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, diltiazem, or timolol. Now, uh, aspirin and Plavix. A, these cats have a high incidence of thromboembolic disease. That hypertrophy septum, ventricular septum, is sticking out in the ventricle and blocking outflow. It's an outflow obstruction, and that's why we get the murmur, okay? But it sets up for thrombi to form, which can cut loose and cause uh, thromboembolic events. Saddle thrombus is the worst case scenario, but you can see strokes, kidney infarcts, all sorts of things. Okay, so we put them on either aspirin, Plavix, or both to try to decrease that risk of thromboembolism. Uh, truthfully, the evidence is not strong that it does a lot of good. Uh, that it truly decreases the instance. But they tend to be fairly well tolerated, especially the aspirin, uh, so you'll see it used. And I'll talk about these. I have a section on anticoagulants. I'll talk about them a little more. Yes? Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Basically, uh, uh, there they're taking it, they're taking it for clock prevention, anticoagulant mostly either for myocardial infarction to prevent heart attacks or for strokes, one of the two. But that is indeed why uh, people uh, take aspirin. I don't know if I want to say old people <laughs> necessarily. I'm not taking it, but I'm wondering if I should. <laughs> okay. 
So we'll come back to that. The dose has not really worked out very well either in the cat. We have a pretty good idea on the dog for aspirin, but not so much the cat. Okay.